Um, our speaker for this afternoon is Dr. David Oshinsky. But before that, I'd like to thank UMA Financial Services. You already heard from them. I'd like to thank them for sponsoring this afternoon's lecture. I know you've already heard Dr. Oshinsky speak. You probably have heard his bio, but I figure there's no harm in hearing it a second time. So he's the director of uh, Division of Medical Humanities and a professor in the NYU Department of History. He has, he's a world-renowned world author, has written multiple books, including A Conspiracy So Immense, that's the world of Joe McCarthy, which was a New York Times notable book of the year. He's also written Worse Than Slavery, which won the Robert F. Kennedy for its at Robert F. Kennedy Prize for its distinguished contribution to human rights. And he's also sadly written about polio, and that's what we're going to be hearing about this afternoon. So um, he received the Dean's Medal from the Bloomberg Johns Hopkins School of Public Health for his distinguished contributions to the field. And Bill Gates wrote that Oshinsky's polio book strongly influenced his decision to make polio eradication the number one priority of the Gates Foundation. Dr. Oshinsky's most recent book, Bellevue, and that's where he is, or works at currently, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem at America's Most Storied Hospital, published in 2016, has won numerous awards, and his articles and reviews appear regularly in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Review, and other international publications. I would like you all to please welcome Dr. David Oshinsky. It's me again. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I will, can you, is this microphone reverberating? Can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, in his wonderful talk this morning, said that you should celebrate your successes. So I hadn't intended to talk about this, but I'll tell you a, a story uh, that hasn't made the rounds. Um, so in 2005, uh, the polio book was one of the three books nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And um, a reporter called me up and told me this. And the reporter wasn't supposed to because the Pulitzer is the one prize that all three, the two other nominees and the winner are announced at the same time. They're not announced in advance. Uh, and I made the mistake of asking the reporter what the other two books were. And one of them was a book about slavery by a Harvard professor. Another was a book about democracy by a Princeton professor. And mine was a book about polio from a then professor at the University of Texas. So I figured my chances were zero. They were so low, in fact, that my wife went to New Orleans to visit one of our kids on the day of the announcement. <clears throat> and when they announced that polio had won, she was at a department store in New Orleans and I called her up and said, Jane, we, we won, we won the Pulitzer Prize. And she was very excited and the salesperson asked her, what did you, your husband win? And uh, she said, the Pulitzer Prize. And he looked at her and said, oh, I thought it was Powerball. <laughs> so there are limits to everything. <clears throat> uh, I am old enough to remember the days when there were no vaccines before the Salk and Sabin vaccines. I lived as a kid in New York City and every summer, polio would come like the plague. 
you would, around Memorial Day, the New York City newspapers began to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, put in the number of kids in polio wards in the city hospitals. It was like baseball box scores. Um, beaches would close, swimming pools would close. Uh, we were told that we couldn't go to the movies, we couldn't be near other children, um, and uh, it, was, it was difficult, although my parents were obviously more frightened than I was. This was the middle class nightmare, the crack in the middle class picture window. We had become, after World War II, this child-centered society, and here was this awful disease that preyed on children, crippled children, and, and killed them. And what I remember very, very well was when the summer ended, we'd go back to school, and you would see kids in leg braces, kids in wheelchairs. You see those awful photographs of kids in iron lungs, and you'd see the occasional empty desk where the child had not made it through the summer. And this went on and on and on every year. And what is interesting is that once the two vaccines came, all of the issues about polio, which had been number one disease in America, basically were put aside. It was a disease, there was no cure, there was no prevention, and suddenly it was gone, at least in the United States and most of the world. And therefore, questions like, why did it come in the summer, have never been fully answered. Um, polio, interestingly enough, is a disease of the 20th century and of the West in epidemic form. It's been, endemically, it's been around for centuries, but in terms of thousands of kids getting this disease, it's basically 1920 forward, and countries like the United States, Canada, Western Europe, Russia, and the like. And we really don't have an answer for this. The best answer I can give you is that polio is a disease of cleanliness, meaning that in the 20th century, particularly in the West, we became a much more antiseptic society, and children were less likely to, to be exposed to the disease early when they had maternal antibodies and the disease itself was less serious. That is really the best answer we have. But it is interesting that it only came in the summer and it only was in epidemic form in the 20th century. What I'd like to do now briefly is just give you a kind of history of how the battle against polio evolved. We all know that without FDR getting polio, it probably would not have become our national crusade. And the question of why FDR got polio, um, I, I, have, I have my own ideas, but I only formed them after my editor asked me. She said, why did FDR get polio? And I said, he was unlucky. And she said, you know, we're gonna need more. So I had to do a kind of timeline for FDR. And here it is very briefly. FDR was raised, as you know, in the Hudson Valley on an estate at Hyde Park. He spent the first, the first 16 years of his life in a kind of bubble. He didn't play with other children. He was homeschooled. And he was not really affected by childhood viruses or germs. But then, when he goes to prep school, then Harvard, Columbia Law School, and forward, his life is like a medical encyclopedia. He comes down with everything. Indeed, he almost dies of double pneumonia in the 1918 
uh, flu epidemic. So I had to make this kind of timeline, and it goes like this. FDR leaves, he has no immunity to anything. Then, as he gets into larger society, he comes down with one illness after another. In 1920, Roosevelt runs for vice president of the United States on the Democratic ticket. It's not a good Democratic year. It's not a good Democratic decade. And FDR loses badly. But he's seen as a comer, this big, strapping, good, <clears throat> solid aristocrat who seems to have feelings for the other groups in society. And what the Republicans decide to do, and this was tit for tat, is they subpoena Roosevelt to come down to Washington after the 1920 elections. He had been an assistant secretary of the Navy during World War I. And there had been a scandal about homosexuality in the Navy. Roosevelt had nothing to do with it. But the Republicans hauled him down, grilled him for three days in the brutal summer heat, and it's possible his immune system was compromised. Roosevelt then decided that he would go up to his family estate at Campobello Island off the main Canada coast. But beforehand, he stopped at Hyde Park and went to a Boy Scout jamboree. The last photograph we have of FDR walking unassisted is with his arms around young Boy Scouts. And that is amazing because after that, no photos of Roosevelt walking. He then goes to Campobello Island. He engages in frenetic physical activity. He swims in the Bay of Fundy. He says he's never felt water that cold. He spends the afternoon in a wet bathing suit doing correspondence. I guess what my mother told me, change your clothes when they're wet. It's not good for you. The woman's a medical genius. In any event, Roosevelt goes to bed not feeling well, wakes up the next morning with a full-blown case of polio, paralyzed from the waist down. It almost kills him. In, in a political sense, it's actually good for FDR because from 1920 until 1928, the Republicans dominate the political scene. And if Roosevelt had run for political office, he would have lost again. What Roosevelt decides to do in the interim is to set up a foundation to fight polio, to find the cure and to find the treatment and the prevention. And he buys an estate down in Warm Springs, Georgia, which has a kind of gigantic, uh, high-level chemical, very warm water that, that polio, they're called polios, can try to swim in and help themselves and basically restore their muscles. In fact, it's quite impossible. Once you get polio, the chances of a recovery are very slight. So really, you're talking about a prevention. But what the March of Dimes does, and that's Roosevelt's charity, I consider it the most revolutionary foundation in the history of the country. The idea of the March of Dimes, and basically Roosevelt went to his friends on Madison Avenue to figure out a strategy, was that until this point, when there was a charity, it would be a couple of very wealthy men who would put big money together and you'd have a house for wayward children or something. What Madison Avenue decided was that the March of Dimes would turn fundraising on its head, meaning that they didn't want big money from a few, they wanted dimes from the millions. 
No one was too poor to give a kid a dime so that that kid could walk again. And what it also did was to get parents motivated to join the March of Dimes, to volunteer. My mother was a March of Dimes volunteer, as was virtually everyone in the neighborhood. So this was a great strategy. And when you look at what else the March of Dimes did with fundraising, they were the first ones to use celebrities. They were the first ones to use poster children. They were the first ones to have mother's marches like the Komen Foundation does today. I'll give you one example of how good their fundraising was. I came across a photo in the March of Dimes archives. This should be a good test for this room to see what you remember or what you know about previous generations. Every year on FDR's birthday, the big hotels around the United States would, rent, would give their ballrooms free of charge to the March of Dimes to raise money. In New York City, it was the Waldorf Astoria, which was the great hotel at that time. I came across a picture of thousands of people in this ballroom for the March of Dimes celebration. And in the photo, you can see Grace Kelly walking down the aisle in a Dior gown. The music is being played by Rogerson Hammerstein and the background has been painted by Salvador Dali. You don't get more star power than that. I don't know what it means to someone who is 25 years old in this audience, but to old timers, that is quite a lineup. What the March of Dimes did was also to revolutionize medical research. They raised more money than every other charity combined in the United States, with the exception of the American Red Cross. And they took about 25% of that money and put it into polio research. It was quite remarkable. You have to realize at this time, there was no NIH or CDC or FDA with any sense of basically taking care of how we vaccinate people, the very, very small numbers. And Big Pharma was not deeply into research either, so it sort of fell to volunteers, people to raise the money. What the March of Dimes did with this tens of millions of dollars was to put together a virology committee and then to decide what needed to be done to have a vaccine. There were basically there were a couple of things. They needed to know, firstly, how many types of polio virus there were. So they did this enormous typing program, and they found that there were essentially three stable strains of polio. So if you could pack all three into a vaccine, you were on your way. They also needed to find as much polio virus as they could to pack into a vaccine. And the only polio researcher to win a Nobel Prize was a man named John Enders. And what Enders figured out was how to grow polio virus in vitro safely so that there was essentially now floods of polio virus that could go into the arms of millions of children. And you also had to figure out how polio virus traveled through the body. And by that I mean the belief first was that it went through the nose, into the brain, into the central nervous system. Therefore, it was never in the blood and a vaccine would do no good. But researchers, and I'll talk about them very briefly, researchers figured out that actually polio went through the mouth into the digestive system, replicated there, in most cases was excreted out immediately, but in a small number of cases went through the bloodstream into the central nervous system and therefore a vaccine could do its work in the blood. What the March of Dimes did after this typing system was to hire people and what they, what is really remarkable is the 1940s in particular, 
was an era of enormous anti-Semitism in medicine, and also it was very much gendered. It was very much anti-woman. The March of Dimes didn't care. It simply wanted workers who would follow the orders that this other vaccine committee had demanded of them. So the two biggest research grants went to Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, both of whom were Jews. Um, and they were the ones who developed the two different vaccines. Salk and Sabin despised each other. Um, I'll talk about briefly a little bit later. Um, but the, the March of Dimes made them play nice and basically share information. At a time when it was very difficult for women to get a start in me medical research, the March of Dimes hired two women who basically, I'll, let me put it this way, without whom there would not have been a vaccine this quickly. One of them was a woman named Isabel Morgan. She was the daughter of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who had won a Nobel Prize earlier uh, talk, uh, writing about heredity uh, and genetics. Isabel Morgan was an extraordinary researcher. She went to Stanford, then Johns Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania, and finally got a job at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. She loved her work. She began doing polio research, and she was working on an inactivated or killed virus vaccine that Jonas Salk was also working on. Isabel Morgan, by my count, was about a year and a half ahead of Jonas Salk. What Isabel Morgan decided to do firstly was to move from the Rockefeller to Johns Hopkins, because at the Rockefeller, she got the worst lab space, the lowest salary, the hardest trek in getting tenure. Hopkins was better. It allowed her to work, it paid her well, and she now had this extraordinary vaccine close to fruition. At the height of her research power in 1949, Isabel Morgan got married, raised a family, and never came back to polio research. This was kind of the choice that women had to make at this point, and still, to some degree, have to make today, and Morgan simply left the field. Would she have beaten Jonas Salk to the punch? It's hard to say, <clears throat> one reason being that Isabel Morgan was a little skittish about taking the final step, which was basically using this vaccine on children experimenting with children. I think that what we can say is that Isabel Morgan blazed the trail that Jonas, talk, the Jonas Salk took to completion. I've looked at her papers. Uh, in, they're in Philadelphia at the American Philosophical Society. And there are these wonderful letters from Thomas Hunt Morgan to his daughter Isabel, whom he called Ibby. And he would say, Ibby, you're doing God's work. You're going to save the lives of tens of thousands of children. We love you. Keep it up. And there'd usually be a PS at the bottom which said, when are we going to see grandchildren? <laughs> so you can sense that there was this dichotomy that she had to deal with. The other researcher, female researcher, was a woman named Dorothy Horseman. She was the first woman <clears throat> to become a full professor of medicine at Yale. And she was a remarkable researcher. And it was Dorothy Horseman, along with one other person, who figured out that poliovirus did not travel through the nose into the brain, into the central nervous system, that in fact it went through the mouth, into the digestive system, and in some cases into the blood. And without that knowledge, the polio vaccine would have been stunted. 
So what is really extraordinary at this time is that the March of Dimes was reaching out to the best researchers who would follow the program regardless of gender, religion. It, it was irrelevant. The other thing I'll mention, um, which I think an audience like you um, would find interesting, other audiences less so, is the March of Dimes was the organization that thought up the concept of indirect costs. And by that I mean the following. In 1940-something, very early, John Enders, the eventual Nobel Prize winner, John Enders got a $50,000 grant from the March of Dimes. Harvard turned down the grant. And when the March of Dimes asked why, Harvard said, it's nice that you're giving Dr. Enders 50 grand, but who's gonna pay to light his lab? Who's gonna pay to heat his lab? Who's gonna pay for the animals he's using? Who's gonna pay for the insurance? We just can't do that. So what the March of Dimes did was to go back and to figure out a system where the grant came with indirect costs that would be paid to the university where the grant was based. And that really is the lubricant that keeps much of medical research in academia moving forward. And would someone else have thought of it? Sure, but in fact, it was the March of Dimes that did it, and it got the program moving very, very quickly. In 1953, Jonas Salk was ready to test his killed virus vaccine on children. Salk had tested on monkeys and chimpanzees. His vaccine seemed safe, and, and the efficacy level was very high. And just in the year before 1953, he tested his vaccine on children in a home for the feeble-minded in Pennsylvania. That was what was done in those days. Salk would just get the go-ahead from the director of that institution, and he would test. And then he felt, and the March of Dimes felt, that he was ready for a mass testing of this vaccine. It was decided that this would be a double-blind study with neither the kid given the shot nor the person giving the kid a shot knowing which was which. There'd be a placebo, there'd be the real vaccine, and there'd be some observed controls. Jonas Salk opposed this vehemently. Salk believed that his vaccine worked and that it was unconscionable in the middle of polio season to give half the study a placebo. Those kids were going to get polio. And in fact, it turns out that many of them did. But the March of Dimes needed to pass scientific muster so you would have now a double-blind study. How many children were in this? Almost two million. Can you imagine a study today of a vaccine? No one knows how well it works. No one knows how safe it is. And parents are throwing their children into line to be part of this study. It's beyond remarkable given what we know about the anti-vaccine movement today. And what are the reasons? One was that people had enormous faith in the March of Dimes and the scientists. They had been giving money for over a decade, and they were saying, where is that vaccine? The other thing is that people like my parents understood risk versus reward. They saw polio every day. It's a visual disease. They were terrified of it, far more terrified than they were of an experimental vaccine. What we have today is that vaccines have done their work so well that they've erased evidence of the good that they do. So if a parent today said, why should I give my kid a polio shot? Where's polio? Well, 
I'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> the study is done, and I will say, um, I was not in the study. I was one year too old, and my mother was furious. She wanted me in that study. Um, she was a, we are Jewish, she's a very tribal woman, bless her heart, and her feeling, I swear to God, was Salk's Jewish, we're Jewish, how bad could this be? <laughs> well, excuse me, it takes a full year to analyze these basically millions and millions of cards. It's pre-computer, all hand done. And it, one year later, the word came down. It was extraordinary. It was like a, a national holiday was declared. The vaccine was safe, potent, effective. Church bell whistles told, factory whistles went off, people were hugging each other in the streets. It was this remarkable moment. Dwight Eisenhower invited Jonas Salk to the White House, and for the first time in anyone's memory, Eisenhower broke down in tears as he thanked Jonas Salk for saving the children of the world. This, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, was the high point of respect for medical science. I don't have time to go into the Cutter incident, which was right after the vaccine was declared safe, potent, and effective. It was mass produced too quickly and caused very serious issues and reaction, particularly in this state. Um, it was mainly a West Coast company called Cutter Laboratories that was given Salk's formula to inactivate the virus, the very deadly polio virus. And there was very little oversight, and Cutter began producing lots of vaccine that had virulent polio virus in it. States like Oregon, California, Utah, Washington State, had lots of kids who came down with polio from that vaccine. And the entire rollout was stopped. But what is really, I think, interesting to me is that once it was found out who was responsible and that vaccine was taken off the market, parents put their kids right back into line. In other words, there was no additional hesitation. And I think that goes back to faith in government, faith in elites, and also just a sense of risk versus reward that we don't have today. Uh, let me move on quickly. Um, Albert Sabin, as you know, came out with the live virus oral polio vaccine. And what that does really is to put live virus into your body, but it's attenuated to the point where it will make for an immune reaction without causing a serious case of polio in the person taking it. Sabin can't test in the United States because Salk has tested on so many children here. So in one of the great stories of the Cold War, Sabin is allowed to go over to the Soviet Union and to the Eastern Bloc countries in the late 1950s and test his vaccine. And this is no double-blind study. He basically gives his vaccine to 90 million children. I mean, this was Joe Stalin's Russia. Albert Sabin actually would write letters home saying, I love experimenting here. You tell people to be here at 9.30 in a straight line, and there they are. Um, and there was, a, there was a reason for this. It was the Soviet Union. Anyway, Sabin comes back with incredibly positive numbers, better than even Salk's. And most vaccine makers at this time and vaccine researchers do believe that 
that the live virus vaccine is better than Salk's vaccine. It's easier to take because you don't need a needle. You just do it with a dropper on the tongue. And, and they think it gives better immunity because it's actually a natural infection. So what happens is the Sabin vaccine moves the Salk vaccine all the way off to the side. And now the Sabin vaccine is the vaccine of choice by the 1960s. Albert Sabin is a sore loser and a sore winner. Um, he goes on television and says, we now have the right vaccine. And of Jonas Salk, he says, I could go into my kitchen and do what that guy did. Um, what is absolutely extraordinary is that Jonas Salk is the only major polio researcher never to have been inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. Sabin and his clique blackballed Jonas Salk. <clears throat> it's embarrassing. Um, what is interesting, however, is that even when Sabin's vaccine was now the vaccine of choice, Jonas Salk was still seen by Americans as kind of the people scientist, and Albert Sabin was the scientist scientist. Um, Jonas Salk was once asked if he felt bad he never won the Nobel Prize. And he said, you know, I don't feel that bad because most people think I did win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> there is one problem with Albert Sabin's oral polio vaccine. In an infinitesimally small number of children, about one in 750,000, the vaccine reverts to virulence in the gut and the child will come down with polio. What that means is that Jonas Salk may have gotten the number down from 50,000 to 1,500. Salk got that number down to about 20, but he could never get it down to zero because those were 20 cases of vaccine-induced polio. Sabin never admitted this. Um, and Sabin and Salk both died close together in the early 1990s with both believing that Albert Sabin was the winner, that his vaccine had taken the field. But as you pediatricians know, in the mid-1990s, the Pediatric Society, the NIH, went back to a juiced-up version of the Salk vaccine because they could never get the Sabin vaccine down to zero. And using the Salk vaccine, they completely wiped out polio in the United States, in the Western Hemisphere, in all, actually in all but two or three countries in the world. Alba Sabin would turn over in his grave if he knew how this turned out. Um, when I talk about the people scientist and the scientist scientist, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2000, Time Magazine did its usual, you know, the 100 greatest minds of the 20th century. And on the cover of that issue, was Albert Einstein lying on a couch being psychoanalyzed by Sigmund Freud, and there was a picture of Jonas Salk on the wall. Those were the three people they chose. Uh, and I think, it, in a way, it's, it's very, very fitting. Let me conclude by saying that polio is very close to being eradicated. Um, I mentioned in the earlier lecture that only smallpox has been fully eradicated. And it's easier than polio to make that eradication happen because smallpox had no silent carriers. 
polio does. A lot of people carry the virus without showing any real symptoms, which means you have to do mass vaccination. And in the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st, Rotary International, the Gates Foundation, the WHO, the CDC, began a worldwide campaign to end polio. And they have eradicated about 99.9% of the cases. While polio virus only circulates today in Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, what do these three countries have in common? They, all of them have what I would call weak infrastructure for public health, but so do many other countries around the world. These are also countries where religious extremists, the Taliban or Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria, are violently opposed to vaccination. So getting vaccinators out in the field and protecting them has become a very big issue. If you read the papers, you know, I think well over 100 vaccinators, mostly all women, have been assassinated in Pakistan, largely in areas where the Taliban resides. We are close, however. The numbers often are in the low hundreds or less. We are this close. And the beauty of this entire scenario is that we are going to need both the Salk and Sabin vaccines to finish the job. Right now, we use the Sabin. And we use the Sabin because it's so difficult in, in very remote areas um, to use a vaccine that's more temperature sensitive and needs needles, um, and you have to train the vaccinators and the like. So the, the, the deal is that you're going to get the Sabin vaccine to bring these numbers as far down as you can, and then you're gonna go in with the Salk vaccine to finish the job. Can we do it? I think we can, although I've been saying this for 10 years. We are this close. We are this close to wiping out the most insidious childhood disease in modern history. Smallpox was first, and I hope the day comes that I can see when polio will be the second human infectious disease to be wiped from the face of the earth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't know if there, is there time for questions? Yes. Um, is there a microphone around or? Three of them. Three of them. Okay, anyone who would like to ask a question, I would love to hear it. I might have a question. I'm to your left a little further. Um, I'm a proud Rotarian, and I would just offer a little bit of history that the Rotary International started its first uh, uh, polio vaccination campaign well before the timeline you presented. The first uh, campaign they started was in 1979 in the Philippines. Um, my knowledge of this also would suggest that Nigeria and the entire continent of Africa was declared wild polio type free completely this spring. There is still vaccine derived uh, virus circulating. In the political climate, there's only been two confirmed wild type um, polio infections, one in Pakistan, one in Afghanistan, and of course the question is, how many are we missing because of the political climate? I thank you for your talk. It was marvelous, and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. And, uh, and, and let me give another shout out to the, Rot to the Rotary. They are, they are just amazing. I, I'll just, I'll give you one example. I, I speak at Rotary events because I'm so touched by what they do. 
I was at an event in West Texas. Um, the, the Rotary Clubs of West Texas got together. And there was a guy sitting next to me. Our politics couldn't have been further apart. And when he found out I wrote for the New York Times, I thought there was going to be a gunfight. <laughs> the problem being I didn't have a gun. Um, in any event, I found out later that evening that this man collects medical supplies of all types, takes his own 18-wheeler, and drives them across the border into barrios in Mexico and gives them out for free. So politics are irrelevant in that case. And that is exactly what the Rotary does. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, in 1955, I was just a little kid, and I, I woke up, and I, w I was paralyzed. I couldn't walk. And my dad was a professional football player and grabbed me and ran me down to the hospital. And they were trying to put me on an iron lung, but I, I wouldn't go in. And um, the next day, I woke up, and I could walk again. It was uh, unusual. I, I don't know what happened. But uh, I think the soft vaccine was the greatest invention of the last century. It was fabulous. And thank you for your talk. Uh, I agree. Well, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly well up there. Um, what is interesting and, and a little sad about what you've said is that I do know people like you who got polio in 1954, 1955, just as they were testing the Salk vaccine. In other words, they, they were like six months too late. Um, and that, that it, I've always thought of that in terms of those children. The one thing I will say as well about the, uh, the double-blind study, the deal was that those who got the placebo would be vaccinated first the next year. Uh, indeed, that is what has happened with Pfizer and Moderna in those trials as well, right? So I, th I think that, that, that was a, a very important point. Anybody else? I got a question over here. Oh, sure, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, many of us in this audience can sometimes <clears throat> see where the success of vaccines can also uh, be their undoing, as we've seen, you know, people become less... Uh, eager to get them saying, why do I need to worry about polio anymore? Um, do you see a possibility of seeing resurgence in places that have eradicated polio? I, I would say it's possible. Uh, technically, it's only a plane ride away. Um, I think if a number of people with polio or, or carrying the polio virus uh, flew elsewhere, you would probably have polio outbreaks. There were polio outbreaks in Syria um, during the time of the government crackdown when they were literally bombing hospitals. So I would say as long as there is wild polio virus circulating, the chances of a reappearance are possible. That's as far as I would go. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for that uh, <clears throat> informative talk. Um, I had polio prior to the uh, immunizations. And several years ago, I was uh, hospitalized. And the hospitalist, very, very intelligent, very well educated, very observant, said, we're concerned because you've got deep vein thrombosis because one leg is bigger than the other. And I said, thank you for noticing that. Did you also notice that I have a cable varus foot with claw toes? Those are absolutely diagnostic of post-polio deformities. Yeah. And so fortunately, many of the clinicians in the younger age group don't recognize uh, the residual of polio. In the 1950s, the most common orthopedic operation was triple arthrodesis for foot deformities. 
You know, you've raised um, an important point, and that is post-polio syndrome. Uh, a lot of polio survivors are having issues again. It isn't that the uh, virus somehow is erupted. It's sil it was silent, now it has erupted. It's just that the people with polio have had to compensate and rely on certain muscles, and it's almost like a car engine wearing out. And there are very serious cases now of people finding themselves having the same symptoms that they had when they had full-blown polio. The problem is it's not a quote-unquote sexy disease. Every year, more and more polio survivors die because this was from 1955 and before. And therefore, there's very little research going into post-polio syndrome. I, I, to me, it's a, a mistake, but um, that is the fact of the matter. I, yes, had, I had the opportunity at age six to stand in line, both my parents next to me, for the first polio shot, so we got the Salk vaccine in the grade school, and everybody was there. And I think my parents would have said, get in line or butt in, to get me into the front of that line so that we could do that because every parent was scared stiff of the kids that got sick, you know, with any little upper respiratory thing. Yeah. Now, I did have the opportunity when I went to college uh, down at Brigham Young uh, to work next lab, um, as, and I was a, an undergrad with Jim North, who was a virologist right. who had uh, worked with Sabin and uh, I'd never met a guy that was more dedicated. He'd come in for his uh, work and stay all night in a bed there in the lab so that he could get his work done. I thought that's why they got that vaccine out as rapidly as they did. Yeah. But what, a, what a wonderful blessing. I think this is why us older folks had less hesitation about grabbing that, uh, the COVID vaccinations. Oh, absolutely. Because we remember all these Absol things that we absolutely. got before vaccinations were available. Yeah, no, absolutely. When you work for Salk and Sabin, it was a 24-7 operation in those days. I'll, I'll just do uh, one anecdote, and then maybe we'll go to one more question. When Jonas Salk's vaccine was found to be safe, potent, and effective, it was, it was done at a huge gathering at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor where Thomas Francis, who had, was head of the evaluation committee, was located. Salk came up to the podium and he thanked the March of Dimes <clears throat> and he thanked this researcher and that researcher and Sitting right in front of him was his entire laboratory, and he did not thank them. This caused incredible bitterness and broke up his laboratory. Salk later said that it was just an omission of the moment he was overcome, and their names were on the article that he had written and published. But it was an awful oversight. Um, and the reason I bring it up in a way is that when John Enders went to get his Nobel Prize, he said that he wanted two residents, two pediatric residents who had worked with him on in vitro to come along and they split the prize three ways. That is sort of the ultimate generosity and the, I'll say, the ultimate oversight. I don't know whether it was done. I can't imagine he would have done it intentionally, but there they were. And apparently on the train ride back from Ann Arbor to Pittsburgh, Salk stayed in Ann Arbor, the laboratory people just got into a tearful, drunken stupor about how they had been treated. 
Any uh, other questions? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much.